We're going to get started with the next talk. Our next speaker is Dr. Xiao Chao. Uh, he's a PhD in finance at the University of Chicago, consults for Hull Investments, and is affiliated with Macro Financial Modeling, a Sloan Foundation research initiative. And the talk is titled Market Timing, Big Data, and Machine Learning. Please welcome Chao. Thank you. Sorry about it. Which one is? These are ones where, sorry, which one is yours? Um. <coughs> this is my child, Quant Con slides. Sorry, this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It should be good. And then he just switched over to you. Okay. All right, well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Xiao from the University of Chicago, Blue School of Business, and uh, talk about market timing mostly. So the title seems quite broad, but I really just want to think about big data in the context of finance. And big data is everywhere. It's really invaded all aspects of our lives. Whether you're shopping at the local grocery store or if you're making a purchase on Amazon, if you're looking for your favorite YouTube video, or voting for your favorite presidential candidates, all of these make use of big data. And its application is only getting broader and broader. I think mainstream finance could significantly benefit from utilizing more of these sophisticated predictive tools. Now that's not to say there's nobody in finance doing these sort of things. You know, we have Ken Shaw, Wealthfront, and Ren text me around for a while. But I think mainstream finance overall is still making use of a lot of these statistical tools that we've known for 20, 30 years. When we talk about predictive tools, one of the first things that comes to mind is forecasting stock market. So it seems market timing is a natural place to start in utilizing these predictive analytics. And today I'm going to present a simple but effective market timing model and talk about its implications. But before we get there, let's talk about big data and machine learning a little bit to set the background for all of this. I want to go all the way back to the beginning and think about where the word big data comes from. I was very curious. I did a little bit of research. And uh, it turns out the first modern usage I could find of the word big data comes from a computer scientist, John Mashey. Mashey was at, at Silicon Graphics and later rebranded as SGI in the mid-1990s. And he was using the word big data in a sort of in a computing context to describe the advances of computational speeds. The first written usage of, of this word I could find was in a slide deck by Mashi titled Big Data and the Next Wave of Infrastress in 1998. And in his own words, Mashi described this usage as, I wanted the simplest, shortest phrase to convey that the boundaries of computing keep advancing. So it seems like Mashi was using this word in a pure computational context. But that's sort of not exactly what we talk about when we, when we think about big data these days. I think we're thinking more in terms of the interface between computing, <coughs> modern statistics, and data management. So in that sense, Mashi's definition was somewhat narrow. Now, I found a complementary definition by Frank Diebold, professor of economics, statistics, and finance at the University of Pennsylvania. And he was using this word more in a statistics contest. So the 8th World Congress of the Econometric Society in 2000, Diebold presented a talk by the title of Big Data, Dynamic Factor Models for Macroeconomic Measurement and Forecasting. And what he had in mind were these settings in which you have hundreds of right-hand side variables so that more traditional techniques like ordinary least squares wouldn't work so well. Now you might think, hundreds of variables, that's, that's easy to handle. But this was 16 years ago. And we've come a long way since then. So Debo used this word in a, in a more economic slash statistic sense rather than a computing context. And I think by combining Mashi and Debo's definition, we get something that resembles what we mean when we talk about big data today. And since then, we've really come a long way. And I want to just talk about a few examples how big data really has changed how we think about the world. I don't think it's overstatement to call the modern era the age of machines. 
So here's one example. We have two of the best human players in the game with Jeopardy, a trivia game. You got Ken Jennings on the left-hand side, and you got uh, um, Brad Rudder on the right. And, and they're playing against IBM supercomputer Watson in the middle. And these guys are like gods playing against other human beings. But look at the disparity in, in the scores. Ken's got 24,000. Brad's got about 21 and a half. But Watson's got more, significantly more than the sum of the two human players. So the game wasn't even close. In fact, Ken being the sensible guy he is, wrote on his answer board, I don't know if you can see it, that I, for one, welcome our new computer overlords. I think he was only half joking. So Watson wasn't exclusively made to play trivia games, obviously. And IBM has tried to apply these techniques into other different areas, including finance. And we asked about Watson. Jeannie Romney, the CEO of IBM, showed her optimism about the future of predictive analytics. She was quoted in saying, every part of your business will change based on what I consider predictive analytics of the future. And Watson is IBM's attempt in that direction. Here's an example of the so-called supervised learning. By supervised, we just mean that when we train a system to make a prediction, we have a specific target in mind. And in this case, this is one of Google soft driving cars. And we see there's nobody in the driver's seats, and there's a woman looking rather content in the passenger seat. Now, driving is a, is a good example of supervised learning. Because you have a clear objective. You know whether going straight or making a left turn would be the better alternative. And although there's a lot of uh, skepticism surrounding the self-driving cars, I think the underlying technology has undoubtedly made great advances. Here's an example of deep learning, which uses many layers of neural networks to try to capture a high-dimensional nonlinear feature space. It's AlphaGo playing against the game of Go um, with one of the best human players, Lee se of South Korea, and defeating him four to one. What's particularly notable about this application is that it uses reinforcement learning. AlphaGo will play a slightly weaker version of itself over and over again to generate many more data points to learn from, so that it learns what moves lead to the most victories without explicitly understanding why these moves do so. The game of Go has so many potential moves that even with today's computational speeds, there's no way to brute force a solution. So we really have to drastically narrow down the potential set of moves. And that's what AlphaGo is able to do. So these are just a few examples I think are quite notable how big data has changed how we think about the world. And as stated earlier, I think finance could significantly benefit from this data revolution. We see explosion in both financial and non-financial data along with this big data trend. All right, for example, we now have tick by tick data for many financial instruments that we haven't really made good sense of. And we should also think about these predictive tools applied to finance. And forecasting stock market seems like a natural place to start. Of course, this is not a new question. We've been thinking about this for many decades. So I want to go back and see what other people have, have thought about this question. I want to be very explicit in what we're trying to forecast here, which is the equity premium. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, I want to spend 30 seconds. As defined by Investopedia, the equity premium is the excess return that investing in stock market provides over a risk-free rate. In other words, it's the additional compensation that an investor gets for taking on stock market risk. And this quantity is important, theoretically, because it offers insights to understanding a key risk-reward trade-off in the financial mar marketplace and reveals something about investor preferences namely the risk aversion. And this quantity is important in practice because both individuals and institutional investors have to make a decision of how to allocate their wealth in different asset classes. Equity is a popular asset class that many investors participate in, so it will be very useful to know its expected returns going forward to make this asset allocation decision. On the corporate side, the equity premium is often used as an input for cost of capital calculations, especially those that are based on capital asset pricing model. In that sense, it affects corporate decisions as well. In short, the equity premium is a very important quantity in finance that has broad implications. Now, the equity premium is not a constant. It changes over time, and there's been a long-standing debate on whether it's possible to forecast the equity premium with very strong opinions on both sides. 
in the no camp, we see some very big names. Robert Merton and Paul Samuelson are two Nobel laureates, along with the Princeton professor, Burton Malkiel. They've all expressed strong opinion against the possibility of being able to forecast the markets. One of the better known academic contributions comes from Goyal and Wow 2008 that makes the argument that many of the proposed return predictors actually do not, well, do not work well out of sample. Diametrically opposite, in the yes camp, we have equally notable names. Gene Fama and Robert Schiller share the 2013 Nobel Prize, along with John Campbell of Harvard, all have made arguments in favor of predictability. Recently, John Cochran offers a strong defense of predictability by jointly examining forecasted returns and cash flows. Let's look at some of these in more detail. Robert Merton, the 1997 Nobel laureate, thought that we can produce a good estimate, not forecast, estimate of the equity premium, even after the fact. In his 1980 paper, he called attempts to precisely estimate the equity premium a fool's errand. I think what he meant was that there's simply too much noise in the data, such that the signal to noise ratio is very low. And because the equity premium changes over time, you're chasing a moving target. Paul Samuelson, 1970 Nobel laureate, thought that there's no way to predict where the market is going. He was quoted in saying at a conference in the 90s that participation market timing implies a degree of self-confidence, bordering on hubris and self-deception. Very strong words without much qualifications. Burton Malkiel, the Princeton professor, the chief investment officer of Wealth France, and the author of A Random Walk Down Wall Street, told the investors, or told the audience at a conference in 2013, don't try to time the market. No one can do it. It's dangerous. So whether it's Martin, Samuelson, or Malkiel, all of these big name academics have held a very strong opinion that there's no way to forecast the markets. However, there's good reasons to believe that we should see some degree of predictability in the marketplace. Finance theory tells us that the, that the equity premium should vary through time for some very good reasons. For one, investors are facing invest changing investment opportunity sets all the time. Expected returns going forward could be higher or lower, and volatility going forward could be higher or lower. And all of these different combinations lead to changing investment opportunities. In fact, this point was made very strongly by Merton himself in his, in, in his seminal Intertemporal Capital Asset Pricing Model, or ICAPM, in 1973. Changes in the equity premium may also be linked to fluctuations in the macro economy. Investors are compensated by systematic and undiversifiable risks. And shocks to the macroeconomic variables are a very good place to look. The equity premium is also influenced by investor disposition. Whether the aggregate market is overvalued or undervalued depending on, depends on if investors are optimistic or pessimistic. For example, in the late 90s, Robert Schiller famously called the stock market in a, in a state of irrational exuberance in his book by the same name. I don't think there's a doubt that in the late 90s, investor sentiment was the first order determinant of asset prices. For all of these reasons, it seems to be the case that we should be able to forecast the equity premium using the appropriate information sets. For example, variables that capture the state of the economy are a good place to start. So inflation or the Baltic Dry Index are two possible variables. Variables that reveal investor expectations are another good place to look. For example, scaled price ratios. Prices incorporate forward-looking information from investors. And by scaling these variables by fundamentals, we get a normalized variable that we can compare at different points in time. Variables to show mispricing also may be promising. For example, the aggregate short interest of individual securities in the cross-section may, may be a good proxy of how undervalued or overvalued the aggregate market is. Along this train of thought, many predictions have been proposed in the academic literature, including the aforementioned price ratios, but also bond spreads, technical variables, and so on. Early work by Farmer and French and Campbell Schiller showed that the dividend price ratio is one such variable that does appear to capture expected return variation, especially at longer horizons. And Cochrane offers a strong argument recently. So for the last two decades, we've had this debate 
of whether it's possible to forecast that group premium. I think there are a few changes that now tilt the favor in favor of predictability. We see a data explosion. Like stated earlier, the availability of both financial and non-financial data have massively increased on the order of magnitudes. Along with that, we see new and novel predictive analytics. These modern machine learning techniques that try to make sense of all this new data. And partially because of these two reasons, we see an evolution in academic literature that is increasing evidence that market movements indeed can be forecasted. And writing these three changes, Blair Hall and I wrote this paper titled A Practitioner's Defense of Return Predictability that leveraged these changes to build a market timing strategy. And we show that it's possible to time the markets. And maybe not surprisingly, it's beneficial to do so. Our market timing strategy doubles the return buy and hold from 2001 to 2015 with half the risk. Compared to the traditional finance papers, there are a few things that are different in this paper. First and foremost, we consider predictability from the investor's perspective. So the question is, if you have this knowledge of predictability, which you should, all these papers are public, then can you do something about it? <coughs> we also use a wealth of data. We use a larger data set than any of the previous predictability studies. And they're at different frequencies, whether it's daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and we combine these. This paper is hopefully easy to replicate. The data is publicly available so that all of you can keep us honest. I want to switch gears and put on my academic hat and talk a little more about this paper. If you're interested, this paper is available on the Social Sciences Research Network. The research question we go after in this paper is, can we predict the equity premium well enough to form a trading strategy? And in asking this question, we want to participate in this predictability debate and take a step towards resolving this debate from the investor's perspective. The traditional perspective has been from the econometricians. And the question was, can we forecast the equity premium statistically? Here, we ask a related but different question in that we ask, if you know return predictability, if you know all this literature, can you do something about it? And to the extent that one can form a profitable trading strategy, predictability is going to be important economically. In this paper, we're going to evaluate and combine 20 predictors from the literature. And in doing so, we'll capture diverse information sets. To combine these variables, we'll use correlation screening to remove the least informative variables and only keep the most informative ones. And with these screened variables, we'll form rolling window forecasts of the equity premium as well as construct market timing strategies based on these forecasts by investing in the S&P 500 ETF SPY. A back test from 2001 to 2015 shows annual returns of 12%, or, tw or about twice as high, actually more than twice as high as buy and hold in that period. And we get a sharp ratio of 0.85, or four times that of buy and hold, which suggests that we have the volatility of the S&P. To the point of smaller volatility, we'll also get smaller drawdowns for these market timing strategies compared to buy and hold. Now, of the 20 predictions we consider, not all of them were discovered prior to the beginning of our back test in 2001. And including all of these up front is going to build in a look-ahead bias. To get around the look-ahead bias, we consider an alternative strategy that only includes variables as they have been discovered or proposed in academic literature. We repeat the back test, and we get the same results, which indicates that the look-ahead bias in this case is not very big. The bulk of our data comes from Bloomberg. We'll also get data from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, as well as the US Census Bureau. Short interest of Ripak, Rigenberg, and Zoe are from Matt Rigenberg. And from the, for the, from the raw data series, we'll construct 20 variables from this predictability debate, or this literature. Broadly categorized in following groups. We have price ratios, such as dividend yield, price earnings, cyclically adjusted price earnings, and so on. We have variables based on interest rates, such as bond yield, default spread, term spread, and so on. Some variables capture the state of the real economy, including the Baltic Dry Index, new orders and sales, and this co integrated residual among consumption, aggregate wealth, and aggregate output of Latal and Ludvigsen. We include some technical variables, including a moving average indicator, 
and a prism component of several technical variables. <laughs> Additionally, some variables don't easily fit into any of these above categories. For example, selling may, the variance risk premium, the consumer price index, although maybe that fits into the economy, and average short interest. First, let's look at these variables. Here's a large correlation matrix of all my 20 predictors. And the correlations are shaded in green or red, depending on if the correlation is positive or negative. And how dark it is indicates how strong the correlation is. So hopefully you don't need to see the exact numbers to get an idea what th this is about. On the top left, we have these price variables. And not surprisingly, all of these are highly correlated. And the correlation is either positive or negative, depending on if prices are in the numerator or denominator. What's more interesting is that most of this table is not darkly shaded, which suggests that these variables are not, mostly not highly correlated with, with one another. Keep in mind that all of these have been proposed to be able to forecast equity premium. And the fact that they're not all highly correlated suggests that these may be capturing different information sets about the equity premium. For example, the Baltic Dry Index, BDI, as you can see, it's, it's a little, it's about two thirds of the way down, is really not highly correlated with any of the other variables. Its highest correlation is 0.29 with this oil shock variable, second from the bottom, which itself is not highly correlated with, with most of the other variables. To get a better idea of the information sets containing these predictors, here's another table of correlations. Now between the predictors and the one, three, six, and 12 month future market returns. And they're again shaded in green or red depending on sign. For these price variables, we have the intuition that these are slow moving and are able to capture expected return variation along longer horizons. So it's not surprising to see that the first few rows, the strength of correlation increases the horizon and maxes out at the 12 month. In fact, K and short interest are two other variables that also exhibit this pattern. But not all the variables exhibit the same pattern. For example, the consumer price index apparently forecasts future six month returns stronger than any other horizon. The variance risk premium and the Baltic dry index apparently capture future three month returns better than any other horizon. And these patterns indicate that these variables do contain different information sets about the equity premium and points to the possibility that combining these we can do better than looking at them separately. My baseline kinetometric specification is going to be a kitchen sink model that's going to just include all of the variables except for the price ratios, which we saw were highly correlated on the order of 80, 90 percent. So when we start dealing with the multicollinearity, I'm going to take a principal component of the four price variables and include that for a total of 16 variables. And our target is going to be the 130 day ahead market X returns, or the six month ahead returns. We'll have a simple linear model. We'll fit this model every 20 days to get the coefficients and fix these coefficients for the next 20 days, use these to form forecasts for the next 20 days, and also take simulated positions in SPY proportional to the forecast. After 20 days, we'll refit this model and roll this forward. I'm going to compare the kitchen sink model with a slightly more sophisticated way of combining variables that we're calling correlation screening in accordance with the big data literature, but more traditional econometricians may call this thresholding. And the idea is that you only include a predictor if its univariate correlation with your target exceeds some threshold. So the idea is you only include the most informative variables for a parsimonious model. Here we use 10%, but this number is, this cutoff value is robust between 5 and 20%. So now instead of including all the variables in each of the refits, we'll only include these variables that have had in sample correlations greater than 10% in absolute value. I also mentioned that including all 20 of the predictors up front is going to build a look ahead bias. And we'll consider an alternative strategy that we're calling real time correlation screening, which only includes variables that have been discovered. And then you do correlation screening on top of that. And for both of these alternative models to the kitchen sink, we'll, just like for the kitchen sink, we'll refit the model every 20 days and then produce forecasts as well as trading positions and then refit it after 20 days. We can get a good idea how well we're doing forecasting by looking at scatter plots of realized returns on the vertical axis versus forecasts on the horizontal axis. And if your forecasts are very good, 
then you would expect to see that these data points line up fairly well on 45 degree lines stemming from the origin. That's the solid black line in both of these pictures. The dashed green line is the actual best line of the line of best fits for these data points. And if that line were perfectly flat, that would suggest that the forecast and realized returns are uncorrelated and we're not capturing any expected return variation. For the left figure here, we have the kitchen sink model. And we see just naively tossing all the variables in, in each of the refits. We do capture some expected return variation. The, the line is slightly positive, but it's very, very small. Compare that to the right-hand side for the correlation screening model, in which we only include the most informative variables in each, of the, in each of the refits. And by doing so, we apparently capture much more expected return variation. The stash green line is quite a bit closer to the desired 45 degree line. We also form back tests for using these, uh, these forecasts. And here's how the kitchen sink model would have done. It's from 2001 through the middle of 2015. And on the top, we have wealth accumulation processes for the kitchen sink in the black solid line and buy and hold for the, uh, the dotted line that has two big drops. On the bottom are the positions taken by the kitchen sink model. And we see $1 starting, um, I guess this is halfway through 2001, would have compounded to a little over $2 for both the kitchen sink model and for buy and hold. But how these strategies get there look very different. Buy and hold suffers these large and persistent downturns in 2002 and 2008, two big spikes downwards. Whereas the kitchen sink model, the wealth accumulation looks quite a bit smoother. In fact, the model identifies these periods of persistent negative premia and tells us the short, as shown on the bottom here, which is why you see a blip up in 2008. Compare that to what correlation screening gives you. Now, $1 in 2001 compounds to about $5 instead of two. And just like for the kitchen sink model, we see that in 2002 and 2008, for these large persistent downturns, the model identifies these periods tells us a short so that we don't suffer the same downturn as the markets. Here's the same picture for the real-time correlation screening model. And we see something very similar. One dollar compounds to about five dollars. And the positions taken are similar as well, comparing these two. In fact, the first half, the positions are somewhat damped, comparing the two. And the second half, all the variables come in, so it looks exactly the same. Looking at the actual performance metrics, as we suspected, the kitchen sink model and buy and hold SPY earn about the same annual returns in this period, a little under 6%. But the kitchen sink model has only half the volatility, as reflected by the Sharpe ratio is twice as large. The correlation screening model has more than twice the annualized returns as buy and hold, and we get a Sharpe ratio four times as large. So the volatility is also cut in half. For SPY, the annualized monthly drawdown was a massive 55% sometime in late 2008. And that number is more than cutting half for the kitchen sink model and smaller still for the correlation screening models. Looking at the annual returns of these strategies, we really get a sense of how much more volatile the market is compared to these market timing strategies. SPY has, a, has annual returns ranging from minus 36% to positive 32% for a massive 70% spread. For the correlation screening model, we don't see a single down year for these years. And for the real-time correlation screening model, we see two moderate down years. But here comes the bad news. From 2003 through 2006, we see four consecutive years of underperformance for these market timing models compared to buy and hold. And an investor in such a strategy may very well withdraw capital in that time. So in order to capture the benefits of market timing, the higher returns, the higher sharp ratio, and so on, you really have to stay very disciplined in order to ride through these four years. And it's through these large persistent downturns, like we saw in the pictures, that the market timing models really work best. In 2002, when the market dropped 21%, the market timing models beat the market by more than 25%. More dramatically still, in 2008, when the market went down 36%, if you follow these market timing models, you would have beaten the market by more than 50%. So it's really through identifying these large persistent downturns that the model is able to capture that we get some action for the market timing models. 
Now, I've said a lot of good things about market timing so far, but let's take a step back and ask ourselves, is this all too good to be true? We saw that the market timing models work very well in these large persistent downturns, but it turns out that two of the three largest market drawdowns in the last 100 years were in the test period between 2001 and 2015. The third one was the Great Depression. So it's possible that we just got lucky from 2001 through 2015. And a fair question to ask is, what about earlier periods? Do these still hold? And that's something we're trying to do right now, extending the data back at, at, at least till the 1950s and see if everything still holds up. The probability is data availability. Some of the variables you use don't go all the way back. But a good statistician will tell you that only a true out-of-sample test will remove all doubts about this model. So maybe we just need a little more time. To summarize this paper, we'll combine 20 variables using correlation screening, and we'll form market timing strategies based on these return forecasts. The market timing strategy is apparently outperformed by and hold in the back test, with twice the returns and half the volatility. Now, in, combined, in combining these variables, we use correlation screening, which is a simple, if not naive, way of combining variables that don't take into interactions among <laughs> predictors themselves. It doesn't look at the covariance matrix of the predictors. And one, one can consider more sophisticated ways of combining these variables. For example, perhaps lasso or elastic nets with cross-validation that does take into account of the covariance matrix. I think this paper has an illustration of a simple way of implementing market timing strategy that, that's also easy to understand. So with this paper in mind, I want to talk about some implications of market timing. We've been trading this strategy since June of last year. And here's how it did since then. The blue line is the actual trading performance for the strategy. The red line is the S&P 500. And the green line is the 60-40 portfolio, 60% in S&P 500 and 40% in cash. And this goes to um, April 1st when I made these slides and may have changed since then. Since the inception, we see the strategy return a little over 3%, while the S&P 500 has stayed about the same. The 60-40 portfolio is up about 33 basis points. Notably, the annualized volatility for the strategy in this period was 6%, only about a third of the, of the market. And just as we saw in the back test, in August 2015 and January of this year when the market took a nosedive, these models apparently identify these periods and tells us to avoid these large downturns. And you can see in February, we didn't successfully do that. Right? This is a model. It's not, a, it's not correct 100% of the time. So we did move with the market when it fell um, in mid-February. The idea of market timing is closely related to the one of tactical asset allocation. The typical advice coming from financial advisors is to put 60% of one's portfolio into equities and the rest into fixed income. And if this number ever gets out of line, you would rebalance to go back to the constant 60%. Now, if expected returns were constant, this probably makes sense. But if expected returns change over time, which we know they do, then there's no way that a constant exposure could be optimal. In fact, investors should dynamically change their portfolios based on what the forward-looking expected returns are. If you know expected returns going forward are going to be higher than they are usually, you should have a higher allocation. And the reverse is also true. But if you try to do this, at least two problems arise. First, you have to reliably forecast returns. If your forecasts are bad, then there's no point in changing your portfolio because you're just reacting to the noise. But even if you have good forecasts, you have to constantly monitor the forecast and take appropriate positions in order to, um, to make the necessary adjustments. A market timing portfolio resolves both these issues. And I'm going to argue that a market timing portfolio is a superior alternative to buy and hold, at least a portion. The market timing portfolio is going to automatically adjust equity exposure based on the return forecasts, so that investors don't have to worry about rebalancing their portfolio very often. In fact, investors could potentially replace their buy and hold allocation with the market timing portfolio, or at least a portion of it. We saw that this is going to achieve higher returns with less risk in the back test. And it turns out that the market timing portfolio and buy and hold have similar correlations with other asset classes, so that by replacing the buy and hold allocation with market timing, you get about the same diversification benefits across asset classes. The implications of market timing go beyond that of tactical asset allocation. 
turns out investors already market time, especially retail investors, but they, they tend to buy at tops and sell at bottoms, just the opposite. So if you think about what this means, we're buying at, or they're buying, at tops when prices are already high and pushing prices even higher, and selling at bottoms when prices are depressed and pushing them lower, which means this behavior is going to push prices to further extremes and make them more volatile than they should be, which means this excess volatility, or this form of excess volatility, is going to be destabilizing to the marketplace because prices are not going to be as informative as they should be. They're not going to carry as much information value. Compare this to what market timing would prescribe. Market timing prescribes a contrarian spirit that tells you to buy in business cycle troughs when prices are typically low and expected returns are high, and sell at business cycle peaks when prices are high and expected returns are low. Which means in order to execute the strategy, there can be no emotion involved, no fear or greed. Because otherwise, it's very easy to start following the crowd and doing whatever, what everybody else is doing. This contrarian strategy is going to keep pricing in line and results in a more stable marketplace in which prices are going to be more reflective of the actual information. And this is a significantly positive or unintended consequence of market timing. To summarize my talk, big data has taken over many aspects of everyday life. I don't think that's debatable. And its influence is only getting bigger. And finance can really benefit by riding this trend. Again, I'm not saying that nobody in finance is doing this, but finance as a whole can benefit significantly more. My application today, market time with many variables, is really just scratching the surface of, of big data being applied to finance. We saw that Nobel laureates said that no one can time the markets. But advances in big data and new technology make this all possible. And as a result, the academic literature has shifted over time. Of some potential future directions for market timing, we could potentially consider different horizons. In the paper I presented, we're considering a six-month horizon as a reasonable intermediate value for the different forecasting horizons of the variables considered. But we didn't optimize over this. And there's no guarantee that six months is the optimal forecasting horizon. We could potentially consider multiple models to get diversification across models and to stabilize your forecasts. We could potentially incorporate even more data. The 20 variables we consider is broader than traditional finance studies, but we should really consider much more broader data sets. For example, why not think about analyzing investor sentiment using Google Trends, for example? And last but not least, we can also consider more sophisticated predictive tools. In my application, I still showed a very simple linear model. But there's nothing stopping us from using more advanced techniques that have shown to be very powerful predictive tools, such as neural nets or trees. As a final thought, it was considered irresponsible to time the market in the last 30 years. Because one, it was thought that it was impossible to do, and you'd be lying to your investors if you told them you could do it. And two, because it was thought that this market timing would be destabilizing to the marketplace. And I hope my talk debunks both these ideas. And going forward, I think it will be considered irresponsible to not have part of your portfolio in the market timing business for the next 30 years. Thank you very much. Please. Uh, Okay. Do you have something specific in mind, like a time series momentum strategy, or? Any time following uh, on the index. Sure. Um, so we didn't do explicit comparison, and uh, I guess the point is, I guess it's it's exactly what you're what you're trying to do here. And what we're trying to do here is, is I think the goal is to compare to buy and hold because this idea of how market time will compare to to a buy and hold strategy. So um, if a, if a trend following strategy also times the market and uh, it does better than the market. I think that favors my argument, because that's, to me, that's also a market timing strategy. Please. You said uh, uh, the strategy puts the portfolio in a proportion to the market. Sometimes it was like more volume, sometimes it was half volume, or something like that. How did you work out what proportion put into the market? So it's actually, uh, uh, in, the, in the paper anyway, it's a, it's a simple linear allocation. So, if the forecast is what the historical um, equity premium has been, 
then we want 100% exposure. And then you get the second point by thinking that if the forecast is zero, you want a zero exposure. And you sort of draw a line, and we, we, um, we cut off the line because the slope gets very big. So we, cut, we, um, we curtail a line, I guess, at 150% and minus 50%. So you only, at the max, you're 150% long or 50% short. Is it possible to market time your market timing strategy? <laughs> That's an interesting question. I don't know. Because you have specifically four red bars going across a specific time frame and you didn't do well, but yeah. before and after it did really well. And they seem to yeah. be times in which the markets reflected a, a lot of uh, volatility. Maybe an increase in volatility would depend on a, a, a better result with your market. Yeah, so strategy. this is an interesting point because uh, in, in the paper, on the left-hand side, we have first moments, or we're, we're forecasting returns. But there's nothing stopping you from using similar variables to forecast volatility on the left-hand side. In fact, we know we can forecast volatility better uh, using a lot of other stuff. So potentially, we, what we could do, instead of forecasting solely, um, solely expected returns, is forecast both and try to optimize over that sharp ratio, which I think is, is what you're trying to say. Would you say that now would be a great time to get into the strategy with the advent of increased volatility in the marketplace and, and, and uh, a lot of uh, negative news coming out in terms of what's going to happen in the next six months? So I think that, so I mean, I, I don't want to exactly say whether it's a good time to get into the strategy. Um, but uh, I mean, overall, it looks like this thing will do well over the longer term. And you see these four red bars, which means, and <laughs> I think I guess the actual trading um, performance is, is a, it's a better comparison because you see that it gets August 2015, I, I think it was August 24th when you had this big drop, um, and January of this year correct. But it didn't get February correct. We're still along like the market 80% in that time. So when the market went down, we did as well. Um, so I think in order to answer that question, we'll have to actually go back and uh, you know, forecast both returns and volatility and do the exercise that I described. The other question? Yeah, it's kind of um, two related questions. <clears throat> One is that markets evolve, right? So if one yep. will do this, it changes itself. Yep. The second was, you have a point that using market timing should actually decrease volatility, make the markets more stable. But what happens if everybody did this? Yeah, so not everybody can market time. That's a fair question. For every buyer, there's a seller. Um, so I think my point is a little bit strong when I say that investors should, re uh, somewhere in here, should replace um, the buy and hold portfolio with, with market timing, but I think um, we can all do this partially. Um, and if everybody tries to do this, what will happen is that won't be equilibrium. So what will happen is you'll be the guys that can execute this thing better, that can, I guess, benefit from this a little bit more. Um, and that's going to give you, I guess, more of equilibrium. So then I guess you're, you're, you're talking about investing horizon and you're, you're exploiting the heterogeneity in the different investment um, horizons across investors to get it. Yeah, presumably the people who go faster start doing better and it slowly decays towards zero, kind of like trend following as over time. That's possible. Please. How important is future selection uh, to the strategy versus the actual yeah, strategy concept itself? Yeah, so for the paper itself, we saw, you know, it's, it's, it's almost a trivial thing to do, right? We're, we're running linear forecasting regressions here. And uh, I guess the point of the paper is that even these simple strategies that don't really do, um, I mean, future selection in this case is really it's this correlation screening thing that just looks at univariate correlation, um, which I think is it's naive, but it's nice that we do get these results because that, that says even with a simple technique, you get somewhere, which means to me that if you apply more advanced techniques, that could that only improve the performance. So in the production model, we do consider some more advanced ways of uh, feature selection, and it does look like, you know, we're doing better. Um, so when you uh, do the parameter fitting, you're looking at um, how these indicators predict the six-month uh, price change, right? Yep. And the equities, but you're, you're doing the parameters every 20 days. So yeah. are you always looking at, like, a six-month window backwards from each 20-day period? Um, Sorry, I should have mentioned this. So every 20 days, we fit using the last 10 years of data. So you get, I guess, 20 non-overlapping six months. Okay. So I imagine every 20-day window, the parameters, I mean, they might not change very much because the bulk of the, the training data stays unchanged. Sure. You're just kind of cutting off the last 20 days and adding 
Is it a decay model or is it a smooth? It's smooth. So here's uh, what the correlation screen selects over time. And uh, the, you do see some changes, but you're right. There's, I mean, there's nine and a half years overlap, or more than that, nine years and 50 weeks overlap, 48 weeks overlap of, uh, between each of the refits. So no, that's fair. Um, again, we, this is to the point of feature selection. So it's also, to me, it's an illustration of a simple way of doing this that, that seems to get some action. So we didn't optimize over many of these parameters. We sort of just said up front, let's try six months. Let's try refitting it every 20 days. Seems reasonable. It looks like it worked. But uh, we did try different horizons. For example, refitting every 10 days or longer. And uh, it looks like it's also fairly robust. Anything else? Yeah. Okay, you mentioned a um, paper several times. Do you make that available? And you make um, any code available? Sure, so the paper is actually, um, it's publicly available for free on, on SSRN. Um, so just go on there and, and look for the title uh, of Practitioner's Defense of Return Predictability. Here's the title. Thanks. Yeah. Is there a way to get access to the data that you're using for those 20 different Yeah, programs? absolutely. It's on the, it's on the Hall Investment uh, website. Yeah, so um, for, for our back test, we use, uh, to the point of how, how much data we use to refit, we use 10 years to refit. So the data goes from 1990 through 2015, and you can actually just try to replicate what we do. Um, that's, that's one point that, that we're trying to push is, is total transparency for this. So this thing, um, you know, hopefully you can replicate it and it looks like... Where was the data again? I'm sorry? Where did you say the data was available? Hall Investments. Oh, Hall Investments. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what what more complicated strategies can you or like models I guess would you consider or are looking to consider? So other than just not necessarily feature selection, but maybe trying something like I think you mentioned like neural networks or like logic processes or yeah, just, sorry, repeat that. Yeah, 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 what exactly. what models have you like are you planning to consider like uh trying to yeah, so we tried, uh, we tried a few things that uh, are better than I expect to talk about. But uh, again, I think using a simple model does, does pretty well. So using more advanced stuff does not surprise me better. Yeah. Uh, so the, all the indicator variables you're using, are they, um, do they change every day? Or are they things that are calculated? Like, like it's only available at the first of the month. Yeah, so all, all of these are updated every day, but uh, not all of them change every day. So some of these macro variables are going to change at a much lower frequency. Uh, but you're, if you use like daily prices and you compare it, like if, when you look at the last 10 years of data yeah. and you're looking at like six month windows, or, I mean, if you're using like a rolling six month window, so you would have like a new. Yeah, it's overlapping. Like yeah, right. or as opposed to like six month chunks. So we tried both. Okay, yeah. And that's, that's a fair point because we know from at least Hodrick 92 that if, if you have overlapping down on the left hand side, that induces some problems in, in the inference. You mentioned Google Trends data. Um, do, you have an act, do you have a ways to access that? I know that data is fairly limited to, to uh, gather. Oh, no, that was just an example of broader information sets. Because um, that's, that's one of the things I'm trying to push you know, with this paper is it's a, it's a broader set of predictors compared to what traditional um, finance has done. Um, but I, I don't think it's nearly broad enough. There's 20 variables, we should consider hundreds of variables. Uh, last question, yeah. Why 20 days? Twenty is a nice round number, you know. Again, we didn't optimize over over many of these things. It's also a business model. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think we actually thought that carefully exactly why twenty. Uh, thank you for the for the business month comment. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I don't actually. I brought a credit card and a. Okay. Well, I, I can <laughs> okay. connect you on LinkedIn. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I want to get in touch with you. Um, Oh, let me give you my card. Yeah, okay. Uh, I would, uh, it's a holding company, but I run the Battle of Quants. Okay. So I'll be in touch. Oh, great. All right. Thank Thanks. you. It's a great talk. Really Thank good. You. Very interesting. Thank you. Did you mention your variables? I missed the first half. Yeah. Let's see. You had a slide on it, right? Is yeah. Is the slide going to be online? Or uh, they're right not, here? but uh, the paper's online. Okay. And uh, I broadly ca cover most of these, so it's like, yeah. you know, the traditional stuff, yeah. since we do use academic right. um, literature. And there's there are a few that I think are interesting. So. The variance risk premium has received a lot of attention. I think like Deutsche Bank does right. these like 
talks. The, the previous guy probably talked about this actually. Okay. Um, so, yeah, there's a there's a complete list with uh, description why we use them in okay. the paper. Good. I'll take a look. Thanks.